start and start the recording. Okay, thank you, Miriam. So thank you um, for all us for all of us um, coming for the second session of Poems at Midday. And as we announced last Monday, uh, we tried to make this workshop uh, like a glimpse of Irish poetry as varied as possible. So um, in order to go on with the, continue with the mood, we started in last, um, last uh, Monday, but now uh, moving into more contemporary poetry, uh, we have decided to choose a poem that combines the mythological, again, with the personal, as in the case of Yeats' uh, No Second Troy, but written almost a hundred years after No Second Troy. Uh, it's a poem written in 2018, so it's very much, very much uh, up to date, uh, close to our reality, to our everyday lives, but which combines also the mythological and the literary. And our choice was triggered, our choice, sorry, was triggered by the movement in the last 50 or 70 years or more to broaden the literary scope and not just um, complying with, uh, with those um, those poems that are generally sort of enforced by what is what is known as the canon, which is usually created in English speaking universities, but also to be part of that transformation and make our own canons and choose uh, the, the, own po the poems we want to read. So in this case, and we decided to, we started a search for poetry that is more updated, uh, but reflecting, um, what is being thought and what is being written in Ireland today. And so this time we decided to use a poem from a personal blog. Even though it sounds like awkward because it's a personal blog, we haven't gone into the realms of, for instance, e-poetry or all the kinds of poetry that we have available on the internet now. But this is not a poem that has been established or that, that has been uh, already selected or anthologized by any university, let's say, but from but that we have decided to choose from a personal blog due to after we have done our search. So um, that is the reasoning behind the inclusion or behind our selection of today's poems, which is for Penelope by Emma Gleason, uh, which is going to be introduced by Miriam. But before that, I wanted to ask you, or I may write down notes, because uh, anyway, if you can um, send, write down your, your names in the chat so that we uh, get to see who's present and who's absent and was not, and were not, because remember that this, uh, this um, gives a certificate of attendance. So we need to, you need to have three meetings attended for, for a final certificate. So in case you want to have that, please write down your names in the chat. And well, that will be it. Okay. Then, okay, today's poem is going to be uh, presented and discussed, by, and the discussion will be guided by Miriam Germani, who is a professor in phonetics and phonology, uh, just the phonetics and phonology in which students um, read poetry in English. And he, she's already a specialist in women's literature and has been recently involved in the chair of comprehensive sex education and reproductive rights. So I thought she was the one should be in charge of teaching this poetry. Okay, thank you, Pique. So um, I will start by having a look at the um, uh, blog from where we chose uh, the poem we are going to read today. And this is the author, her, her personal blog, where she states that she comes from Dublin, sorry, that she lives in Dublin, but comes from Cork. So we added this map in order to show you where exactly she comes from. She's proud of being from there. And um, you can have a, a look at the, at the blog and um, Kike will share with you the link so that later on you can read some more of her poems. Because in, in this page, although we haven't seen up new updates, uh, there are uh, a lot of poems written by this uh, woman. So a little bit about her, as uh, Kike says, she's not an established author, so there is no, um, I mean, there, there is no biography in, uh, in, the me in the media or in the internet that we can uh, rely on or, or refer to, but her own um, 
comments on herself, uh, stating that she's a writer, a speaker, a sustainability advocate, among other things, and that she has a master's degree in the history and culture of fashion. Although she does, she also does um, contrib con uh, or contributes to uh, a, a news, a new, a, um, not a newspaper, um, a magazine, a literary magazine, making uh, book reviews. And she has published her first book uh, very recently, to 2021. Um, so, so she, uh, this is not a poetry book, so we don't know if she has abandoned poetry or if it's, it's just something that she will continue doing. We tried to get in touch with the author, but unfortunately we haven't received an answer yet. So in case we do contact her, we, we will then comment uh, on, on what she says. So um, to start with the poem then, I give, I'm giving you the title and the image which appears together with the title in the blog. And the, the, um, the name for Penelope and the picture maybe uh, rings a bell uh, in some of you. I don't know if you, what would you associate the picture or and the name with? Any answers, any comments? Ah, I, I see the chats here, sorry. <laughs> no. No, I can't access the chat here. I know, this is Tigas uh, sending the poem to you. Yeah, the poem, sorry. Okay. So, um, this is a reference to um, the character of Penelope in the Odyssey. Uh, before I, I, I tell you a little bit about it, I'm going to show you the... Oh, my computer is kind of slow today, sorry. There. Um, this is a message that appears be, uh, just as you access the poem, uh, which was written by the author, of course, and she states that the poem was inspired by an episode in the Odyssey, um, more, more uh, with reference to what Mary Beard, a British um, scholar, wrote in a, a, a manifesto that she wrote in 2017, Women and Power. Uh, she makes a reference to Penelope being shut up by her son and sent back to sewing or knitting. Uh, uh, but she also has, uh, in, also inspired by the frequent infuriating conversations I have with idiots. So we'll see why she says that when we read the poem. Uh, this is Mary Beard, and this is an image from that um, paper in which she shows also Penelope sitting and Telemachus, the son, uh, standing. And she makes this reference to this. Uh, she, she says that the um, that Western history has a long story of shutting up women. And she mentions the first rec recorded um, instance in the Odyssey, which was written by Homer in uh, six, seventh or eighth century before Christ. And there is a scene uh, at the beginning of the poem in which um, uh, Odysseus has uh, left for uh, his uh, kingdom, Ithaca, uh, to go to the Tro Trojan or participate in the Trojan War, the one mentioned by Kike last, uh, last uh, class. And um, it, he takes, uh, it takes him like 10 years to come back. And in the meantime, Penelope stays faithful, although she has a lot of suitors uh, proposing to her. And this is a scene in which she comes down to where the men are uh, meet, uh, have met, and she asks for a change of topic or something like that. And the son says, go back into your quarters and take up your own work, the loom and the distaff. Speech will be the business of men, all men, and of me most of all, for mine is the power of this household. 
So Telemachus has uh, 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 occupied the, the role of or, or the position of the father while his father is away, representing uh, all men in a way. So um, from this, I'm, we are moving to the poem, which you already have. So first thing we're going to do is uh, I'm going to read it aloud and then we'll start talking about it a little bit. Sun silenced. Your subduing sowed the seeds of sanctioned superiority over us. The women who talk too much and are too shrill and need to calm down and cannot take a joke. And so many fowo bros think they know, shake their heads and say, why did you not cry out? I call up Margaret Atwood and shout, men are afraid that women will laugh at them. Women are afraid that men will kill them. If this still stirs a smirk or worse in some, it means there's far more work left to be done. Okay. Our first idea was to have you work a little bit in a breakout room, uh, talking, uh, talking about the poem, discussing what you think about it. So uh, we are going to assign, as you are, uh, let me see how many present. We have one, two, three, four, five, six. We can have two, um, sorry? You want me to open the rooms? Maybe? Yes, please. Let's have two uh, breakout rooms where okay. the, in the group you can read the poem again and discuss possible meanings or the meanings that it has to, for you. Okay. And after five, eight minutes, we'll meet again. Okay. Everyone's here, I think. Yes. Okay. So maybe you can open your mic now and share with us whatever you want about uh, your interpretation of the poem or whatever you discussed in your group. I can start if you want. Okay. Thank you, Julia. Well, um, the poem is urging Penelope to take action. <laughs> mm -hmm. And because uh, we can read and we know that she was uh, quite submissive in her position, in her attitude. She was waiting for Odysseus to return for 10 years. Um, she was, um, well, we know that she was very intelligent uh, at keeping the suitors at bay. Uh, but at the same time, she could have done more. She could have taken a new life. Mm -hmm. As, uh, I think that, um, well, and that reference to Margaret Atwood has to do with the fact that um, the Penelopean, the little novel that she wrote, fiction about how Penelope was a little bit more, let's say, revolutionary or... Mm -hmm. um, yes. I don't remember reading, I, I read it, but I don't remember. It's the, she takes the lover or it's the the maids that take it? The, the maids, suitor, they, right? yeah. Apparently the maids have taken lovers, or have become yeah. lovers of the suitors, and that's why they... And then Odysseus, them. yeah, and then he comes, he returns and he kills them, or have, he has them killed, right? Yes, exactly. So, like so that uh, reference yeah. that reference has to do with with the fact that the author of the poem would have liked Penelope to have a different attitude to be mm -hmm. to be yeah. more free to to be more let's say to you know take the bull by the horns and do something with her life not exactly. just wait yes uh, okay what about the other group or someone else in the same group any other thoughts May I say something? Yes, of course. Um, with Florencia, uh, we uh, immediately um, thought of the first line, uh, the one that uh, starts by sun silence. Mm -hmm. And we thought of, I mean, um, this this seems to be sort of vo vocative, right? I mean, speaking to the sun, but the sun representing, I mean, all men, or men in general, okay, silenced, 
by men. In this ca case, particular case, being silenced by Telemachus, mm -hmm. her son. And um, coming back to what uh, Julia said, I mean, um, this idea of, I mean, uh, asking women to take action, to, I mean, to start uh, defending and continue defending their rights and getting more rights as time passes by. Because um, this uh, Penelope, as you said, is a Greek uh, mytholo mythological character and Margaret Atwood, it's a kind of con is a contemporary writer, but uh, I mean, women's position or women's status haven't changed so much, even though centuries have passed from, I mean, the Greek empire times till our present times. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there is a line there that, okay, much is there to be done. Yes. Yeah, continue fighting for, continue. After, okay. yeah, so many centuries, as you said, the situation hasn't changed much, at least for some women. That's yeah. it. Yeah. And I, I don't know, I as associated this poem with Ulysses, written by Alfred Tennyson. Mm -hmm. And okay, in such that a last... poem, I mean, there is a clear depiction of, I mean, the whole family, I would say. I mean, uh, Odysseus coming back from war, uh, Penelope at home with Telemachus, and this, I mean, the same situation is uh, retold or told in that particular poem. Yes, I mean, uh, Odysseus coming back with a very arrogant attitude, yeah, and maybe subduing Penelope at home, and mm -hmm. that sort of, um, I mean, um, action or, uh, I mean, relation with his his wife, I mean, being established between Telemachus and Penelope. I mean, mm -hmm. Telemachus assuming the, 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 the role of the husband, okay, the husband, the, the man, the man at home, yeah, and, and uh, treating Penelope uh, in a quite similar way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. exactly. Okay, so maybe we can start uh, analyzing the poem a little bit more. And I'm going to, again, the computer is very slow. There. Uh, we have divided the poem into three parts for the analysis. This is the first one. And in this um, particular part, uh, and, and, and why? Why the division? Well, this part is the one in which um, the author, the poetic voice, seems to be addressing Penelope, right? You're subduing and accusing her of being the, the reason why uh, women have been silent since uh, times immemorial, let's say. As if, well, she was, she, she, uh, yeah, she was silent and did nothing at the time, and as a result, we are still being silent. And the first thing we noticed in this um, poem, from the point of view of literary analysis, the literary features, in this case, uh, a poetic device, the use of um, uh, 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 alliteration, sorry, uh, the use of alliteration in the first lines where you have a repetition of the sound. And we thought, well, what could be the reason for this sound to be repeated? Do, do you have any, could you give any explanation for that? For this, for this sound to be the one used so much in this first part? And maybe associated with the silence? Similar to the onomatopoeic sound that we, mm -hmm. I mean, tend to use when asking someone to to be silent. To uh, hush. Uh, it should be yeah. yes. We also mm. thought of the the s the s sound being a voiceless sound, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. connects with the idea of um, being yeah. silent, and also with the fact that when we are whispering, for example, one of the sounds that you can hear. It, of course, when you whisper, normally you have voiceless sounds, the ones that you you can hear. So 
I associating this whispering to uh, with women who might might not speak up loud or uh, in, in public, but still speak, speak, have a voice of their own. And then we notice some more because, as you see, the poem doesn't follow a, a clear structure or a regular structure. Uh, we have longer lines, shorter lines. And, and then we found this, the, the presence of assonance in the repetition of the O sound. Um, for example, thinking of the word of this uh, compound, O, o woke, uh, while looking for the meaning of, the, of this phrase, we found fake woke, uh, not bo woke. This combination is new in the creation of the, of the poet and probably looking for this assonance to be present. And uh, something else that we would like to mention about this uh, poem, I, I'm, I'm passing the floor to Kike now, who's going to tell you a little bit more. Just as, as regards the grammar of the, um, the grammar, I don't know if you're listening to me, yes. Uh, just as uh, as regards to the grammar of the poem, it's interesting to see how a very, very short uh, noun phrase introduces um, Penelope's subduing, and it's your subduing, and then the only verb is sowed, the only main verb in the, in the clause is sowed, and then the seeds of sanction superiority over us, the women, there it is where the long noun phrase, which makes the whole rest of the poem starts, and we have the seeds of sanction superiority over us, the women, graphologically separated from the rest of from the rest of the poem. We have um, us, um, the women, and then this postmodify this women postmodifier by a relative clause, who which seems to be um, too long, very long, and mostly concerning what men would think about women through polysynthetic coordination, which is which has a cumulative effect. Those probably those those facts that are reported in the um, in the relative clause who talk too much, are too shrill, need to come down, cannot take a joke, are women as seen from the perspective of men. That was our analysis. And then and so many folk will folk will bras think they know shake their heads, those are the men, and here they are introduced in, this, in, the, in the brothers, think they know, shake their heads and say, why you did not cry out, as if accusing uh, the women, which is interesting because, it, because this why you did not cry out comes full circle with some silence, with the silence introduced at the very beginning of the poem. Okay, so now I pass the floor to Miriam again. Okay, so we move to... The, the second um, part of the poem. We isolated the part in which uh, the quotation by Margaret Atwood is introduced. Although, uh, well, you, um, I think most of you know Margaret Atwood, the Canadian author, very, very famous, very, um, uh, has received a lot of honors and, and prizes, so uh, I published a, a lot. So this quotation is not exactly uh, her words. It's like um, a, a quote that has become, uh, or, or that has been assigned to Margaret Atwood from a, uh, a text that she wrote, a paper that she wrote in which she commented on an anecdote, talking to a man and then talking to uh, her women students. Uh, we, this is a kind of a summary of the result of that paper. If you are interested, you can uh, look it up. So the um, in the literary feature here would, would be uh, intertextuality. The, in this case, a manifest intertextuality, because we also have intertextuality in, in the uh, introduction of Penelope in the story, this reference to uh, the Odyssey. Uh, here we have manifesting the textuality in which we have the author of the words, let's say, the, the source, and the, the quoted word with the quotation marks, making it uh, clearly not the author word. And uh, so this would uh, have the effect 
of course, because intertextuality makes it evident the fact that, of course, readers, uh, uh, writers first, when they create their uh, work, are influenced by the voices of others. And, uh, and this may be, um, in this case, uh, presented uh, clearly with the, with the source, but some other times we don't have the, the clear, a clear reference or allusion. As readers, we are also influenced by previous readings, and therefore we can, uh, for example, associate this Penelope to uh, the Penelope in the Odyssey. And in this case, we have a clear reference, so if we're interested, we can uh, look up for more information on Margaret Atwood and her work. Uh, but anyway, this quotation will affect the way we interpret the poem too. And finally, the last part of the poem. Ah, well, here I, I included, we included this reference to Margaret Atwood in case uh, you were not familiar with it. And something interesting to, to notice is the fact that she wrote the Penelope ad, I think Julia mentioned it. Um, she, she was asked to write or to participate of this series in which contemporary authors rewrite ancient myths. And she chose Penelope and she said, I've chosen to give the telling of the story to Penelope. So here we will have the other perspective. We have the Homer's Odyssey showing the male perspective in this novella. We'll, have, we'll find the female perspective, in particular Penelope's perspective. And well, the, the themes of the Penelope are here, and we can uh, maybe uh, also see the, uh, the, the these uh, themes present in the uh, in the poem, or at least uh, some of them. So the last part of the poem, this um, the last line, we have analyzed them as uh, from the point of view of the um, alliteration too. Uh, again, the repetition of this script and the uh, assonance in the sound er. Uh. And we can analyze it as a heroic couplet the, because of this, uh, the structure of the, of the, um, uh, of the two, of the last two lines. The, um, the fact that we have uh, iambic pentameter, we have lines of 10 syllables uh, each, and the um, stressing pattern, let's say the rhythm of, the, of this part is iambic pentameter. That is, that is to say, we would stress, is this still Thurso's nerve who works in some? It means there's far more work left to be done. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, typical of um, medieval and uh, Renaissance literature. Shakespeare, for example, uh, has some the use of heroic couplets in some of his uh, sonnets and in some of the plays. Uh, Chaucer also used that driving pole. Um, and this idea of um, I don't know being uh, this is this was. Uh, a Kike's comment on the fact that this being a heroic couplet might point to the idea of the need of heroic action for women to be um, heard, let's say, to be accepted as equal in society. Um, Kike, I don't, you, you wanted to say something else as, as regards this, I think. No, just a little comment about the grammar, as usual, you know, some some of you know me and, you know, I'm a grammar teacher and I love the way in which um, uh, the author, Emma Gleason, decided to delay all this idea of the work to leave, to, to, uh, of the work left to be done through the, most of the, through the three available grammatical devices we have to delay new information and move given information, or move, probably given information that we already have through the context to new to the place of new information and delay till the very, very end. First of all, through the use of a very long adverbial clause in the first verse. And second, when we reach the final, ver the final line in the poem, we have extra position. It means that blah, 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 Ex an existential sentence. There is far more work. And then finally, uh, the use of the passive voice as if uh, sort of um, as if handing 
in the work to whoever it may be addressed to. So there is far more work than reduced relative cost left to be done, probably to be done by women, by men, by whoever is reading this poem. That is one thing. And the other thing that I wanted to notice is how after all the silence in the very first uh, stanza, very long stanza, which refers to silence, then in the second one, Margaret Atwood is given voice through quotations, which is something maybe we haven't thought about that before. So Miriam, I don't know if you're closing. Okay, yes. Um, as we did last uh, in our last meeting, we are going to close by re reading the poem again. Now with, uh, I don't know, uh, more ideas because of what uh, we shared. So I'll read it again and then we'll see if there is anything else left to say. Sorry to interrupt you, but I just, uh, want, I just wanted to say that what really uh, called my attention was the use of punctuation in the three parts that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. there, is, there are no punctuation signs in the first part. Yes. Okay. You're right. We have the yes, first, right. uh, the question mark ending this part that we consider to be the first, then the punctuation associated with the uh, yes, quotation, right. and finally the couplet here at the end, the rhyming couplet. Yes, interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Ah, thank you. Okay, I read again, and then we can talk a little bit more about it if you want. Some silence. Your subduing so proceeds of functional superiority over us, the women, who talk too much and are too shrill and need to calm down and cannot take a joke. And so many faux woke bros think they know, shake their heads and say, why did you not cry out? I call up Margaret Atwood and shout, men are afraid that women will laugh at them. Women are afraid that men will kill them. If this still stirs a smirk or worse in some, it means there's far more work left to be done. Okay, so any final comments, reflections, how, how the poem got to you or affected you or impressed you in any way? Miriam, can I say something? Yes, of course. This is just like it, right? personal opinion yeah what i really liked about this uh poem um, i liked it and i also i think this is like a difference with the other one is that in this case the, the emma shows like she's not putting the blame or making any comments or appreciation on women themselves but instead showing what women sometimes we have to undergo or suffer or in this case, Penelope. So it's not like putting the focus or the blame on women, but showing mainly what men have done through uh, the passing of time. Let's say from that time up to, I don't, I don't know, maybe today. Let's say up to some point. Yes. But is I the difference with other poems or other uh, pieces of literature? Uh, the the focus is not on women, but mainly on what men have done or have behaved, let's say, towards women. Yes, like uh, 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 apparently at the beginning, there is this accusation to um, uh, a Penelope because it's your subduing what led, um, led us to what the situation is today. But then this reference to how uh, men see women or what men say of women because this, this seems to be all very present day words, let's say. Uh, so the, uh, and the fact that they are still blaming us, like why did you not cry out if you didn't like the way things are or, or what I say or whatever. As if it was possible because may, some, some women may have cried out and they may have ended there too. So uh, it's like, as you say, this um, uh, chasing the, the, the or, or, or focusing on the role of men in our silencing is uh, important in the poem. And then, of course, like a, a kind of hope uh, towards the end, the, or, or, or enticing us to keep on working. 
some things have changed, but there are more things to change. Okay, and any Julia other? Suggest, yes. I just wanted to mention that Julia suggested a very interesting intertextual reading, perhaps with another poem mm -hmm. through the chat. Ah, okay. Ah, yes, sorry, I, I, I wasn't by, saying... By Louise Gluck, who's... She's Louis the Gluck. one that uh, won the Nobel Prize for mm -hmm. Literature two years ago. Ah, okay, thank you, Julia. We are going to have a look at it. Yeah, this is oh, a very, sorry. very nice poem. I love this one. Mm -hmm. I should stop sharing now. Wait a minute, I'm kind of... Ah, oh, here. So that we can... Each other. Very, very interesting. Yes, we'll look up uh, up that uh, poem. Have a look at it and see if we can include it in our classes. Okay. Any other comments or I don't know. Time is up, so we can just uh, leave it here till next Monday. Okay. Thank you, Miriam. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you Cheers. for See this time. Week. Thank you. you bye, bye. Bye, bye. bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Be well. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you all. Bye.